Okay, so get started in about one minute here. Okay. Okay, we're about 302. Let's go ahead and get started while we wait for a few others to, uh, to jump on to the webinar today. Okay. Um, so, hello, everybody. I'm uh, Bill Conforti. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the Association Analytics Virtual Discussion Series for 2021. Our goal is to bring together association professionals with industry leaders and partners and bring value to the community through one on one discussions, expert panels, product overviews, and other educational sessions. Uh, of course, we hope to do this in a way that's fun and engaging and always try to learn from each other in that process. So uh, to this end, I wanna encourage everybody to uh, introduce themselves in the chat, uh, just your name and, and where you're from, and feel free to contribute with uh, questions, uh, both in the chat and in the QA and comments and, and insights uh, throughout the presentation. Um, so this series meets bi-weekly on Thursdays and recordings will be available to everyone that attends. Right, we'll go to the next slide. Um, so today our session is about how to build and implement a solid data strategy. So we're gonna focus on things like data maturity, data governance, and data quality. Um, if you're familiar with uh, association analytics, you know uh, about our data analytics platform, Acumen. So we really believe that Acumen can lead the way to building a culture of data informed decision-making uh, with integrated data and intuitive visualizations and analyses. But uh, in order to to do that, in order to be successful in analytics, you need to build a solid strategy and to address some fundamental issues uh, with your data. Um, so to that end, we've invited a panel of experts uh, from our good friends at Delcor um, to lay this out for you today. So with that, uh, let's go to our introductions. Um, I'm Bill Conforti, uh, Senior VP of Strategy and Solutions with Association Analytics. Um, so today, I'm really just gonna moderate uh, this, the, the discussion and uh, most of the heavy lifting will be uh, from Gretchen and Dan. So I'll turn it over to them for introductions now. Well, thanks for inviting us, Bill. This is a, a good discussion to have and really timely. Uh, my name is Gretchen Steenstra. And like you said, I work for Delcor out of the DC office and I'm joined by Dan. Yes, thank you. Thanks, Bill, for having us today. Yes, I'm Dan Hickey out of our Chicago office and uh, quick background about myself. Um, work on, uh, CIO engagements and IT maturity assessments and then data governance too. Hence, uh, Gretchen and I's involvement today in terms of data seems to be uh, part of most of our discussions we're having with our clients these days. And I do similar work to Dan. I also do a lot of IT leadership and decision-making and data always comes up. You know, are you, are you a data hoarder or a data user? <laughs> and so uh, I think we'll have some good discussion today. Yes. So here, I always have to have an agenda. Uh, there's a couple of things around data. It's such a big topic, but and we only have an hour, so we're really going to try to focus a few minutes on data maturity. What does that look like? How to find a starting place for yourself? What is a data strategy? And again, what you can do to just start it, not be intimidated by it, and if you have a strategy, keeping it alive. And then we'll spend most of our time talking about data governance and really uh, putting these practices to work. And then, of course, we love it if you ask us questions or challenge what we have to say or add on, you know, that's always welcome. Sure. And as we go through this, we'll be keeping an eye on the, on the chat, too. And if there's questions, Bill will be letting us know, too, because although we have questions at the end, please, as we go through this, uh, let us know. All right. Um, data maturity. All right, Gretchen. So <clears throat> really what we always like to do when we start with... Uh, any kind of data engagement, you know, it is important to know where as an organization you're at. And so uh, kind of gauging that maturity level uh, on a different number of different areas is something that we, we, we do uh, to help start facilitating the process. And so some of the areas that before we get into the actual 
uh, and maturity. But some of the challenges that a lot of the, our clients have in the association space too, or the ones we have up here we've listed, uh, there really is no strategy. There's no, no or little governance at all. Uh, data quality issues are pervasive. Uh, you're still running these uh, reports that are manual and have four different people <laughs> cobbling data together to get what they need to, you know, to get that over to the senior leadership team or their board. They're still uh, not really using, uh, you know, the campaign, email campaigns or marketing campaigns to their uh, true capacity. Um, and they just don't even have, you know, performance metrics. I and mean, we talk about key performance indicators, KPIs, and uh, uh, either they don't have them in place or there's still uh, other or they're antiquated, they haven't revisited them in a while. So these are still some of the issues after all these years we're still kind of running into. So, so when you're looking at, you know, the different outcomes that it's hard if you struggle, right? So we say, just start somewhere. So when you're trying to assess your maturity and where you are, how efficient are your processes? How trusted is your data? Um, is uh, everyone's talking about revenue growth, but what are some key areas that you're trying to measure? And then do you have an effective strategy? It, you can have a strategy, but if it's not working for you or it needs adjusted, especially in 2020 and 2021, we encourage you to do that. These should be living, breathing documents. Not that you need to touch them every day, but at least annually, you need to take a look and make sure you're in alignment. And it's really helpful before you shop for a product and call association analytics, they're gonna want you to bring some of this with you instead of just calling them and saying, we need help with data, so, let's get moving, they'll of course help you, but it's much more useful if you start pulling these pieces together so you can have a much more productive conversation. <clears throat> so this is, a, you know, there's lots of maturity out there, like Dan mentioned, Delcor has an IT maturity model, but really the point of this is just, where are you on this continuum? Are you in a restrictive mm -hmm. state where you're just not getting anything done? Like Dan was saying, you're doing a lot of manual work and a lot of guessing it, are you functional? You're just doing okay, but it's not great. Well, and the goal is to kind of get into that effective and innovative where you're doing really well. Mm -hmm. And some, some people are fine if they stay ineffective, they don't need to get into that innovative category, but I think that's a good stretch goal. And we labeled this data governance. This is data maturity. This is data governance strategy maturity, but these are kind of the four classic steps to maturity when you're evaluating yourself. All right, so. Oh. Cool. Brian, gonna put, oh, there it is. All right, so where, what is your association's maturity right now? Are you, do you think you're a beginner, medium, advanced, or you don't know? Okay. So Bill, are we gonna show our results real time or are we gonna? Yeah, yeah, so we, um, We'll give it about 30 seconds or so to yeah. uh, for people to respond, and then Brian can put the results up. It's always an interesting one, too. I always like to see where <laughs> <laughs> how people rank themselves. Right. Sometimes how you rank yourself is not you know the reality. Sometimes you do, yeah. work or you know you might be better off than you think you are. Okay. All right, beginner. This is helpful. Beginner in minute. Okay, fair enough. Now we know where we need to start. The three percent advanced. Please, you know, add some color commentary to this discussion. Yeah, I'd love to hear what you guys are doing, please. All right, so strategy is something that some people love talking about strategy. Some people roll their eyes when they hear about strategy. Um, you know, it's a cornerstone. You have to do a little bit of this. And here's some information. Uh, Bill, do you want to talk about some of the results that we had from our last discussion a couple of months ago? Um, yeah, so these are, um, so, so we've been doing uh, webinars like this, you know, for, um, you know, pretty much all throughout 2020. And, you know, many of them were, and pretty much all of them were focused on different aspects of data. But, um, you know, in previous webinars with, you know, obviously a, a little bit different group, but I think uh, quite representative, you know, we asked the question, does your organization have a data strategy? And this is uh, where we ended up before. So there was, a, the, the questions were, or the choices were a little bit different. So it wasn't like a maturity question, just do you have it or not, right? And so <laughs> right. a lot of people, Start somewhere. a lot yeah. of people said no, um, you know, uh, uh, a few people said they didn't know or, or what's that, right? So there's a, a lot of like really like true beginners that really haven't even started or, or thought about that. You know, but, uh, you know, a fair number, almost half, you know, said that they did have some kind of a strategy, which was um, quite encouraging. Yes. And then it's just a matter of then, okay, so you have something, you know, is it effective and kind of what, you know, uh, what level uh, are you at? And so you know, even if you have one, it's quite likely that you can, 
uh, improve it by, you know, by looking at some of these uh, areas here. Okay. Absolutely. And really the key takeaway for me from that last slide was the uh, less than 50% even had one. So, I mean, um, again, to Gretchen's point earlier, you do have to start somewhere. And what we always emphasize is I think one thing that's a little daunting or overwhelming and why probably so many organizations don't have one is they just feels like this other thing they got to do. And it just, it, it seems overwhelming. Where do you start? And really at the end of the day, you don't, you know, all we're, we always say is like, it needs to complement and reinforce what are you doing, you know, your organization strategy and really anything you do from the data perspective, it really should just reinforce what you're already doing. So you don't have to go out and, and you know, spend months trying to create this uh, overly complex strategy. Uh, it just start thinking about how you want to align your organization's usage of data and making sure that it's just, again, aligned with what you already have for your strategic goals. Again, as we say here, it shouldn't stand alone. It shouldn't be this separate siloed uh, effort or, or entity. So looking at, sorry, Gretchen, were you gonna say something? No, 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 I was just, here's a chart just to get you started, right? And yes. so, uh, you know, you, you can read these, but I don't know, Dan, what's your favorite one when you talk about organization and culture? So again, that's another buzzword of culture, but I think that's, that's what's evolving in organizations. Like Bill said, 50% of people have a strategy that's encouraging. And so I think people are starting to learn to kind of connect the dots and make it part of what they do instead of a chore, which is what you know Dan was describing. Oh, great, we have to build one. I think more and more people are saying, well, of course we have a strategy as an organization, but then how do we layer in some more um, just direct and, and practical things to so it's mm -hmm. not this you know unknown squishy concept? Yeah, nebulous. Yes, uh, yeah. The organization and culture one always stands out to me. Just because that's the one where um, organizations that we're that I'm working with at least you know are still kind of struggling in that because you. you Yes, you can have you. You can get your plate, your data in a place where um, there's a greater level of maturity, and maybe you get your you know these dashboards in place, and you actually get the data in a place where you're able to to use it and consume it. But what are you doing with it then? That's the big thing. You know, are are the different stakeholders of the organization able to interpret and use that data in a consistent way, uh, or not? You know, so that 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 level of how is an organization, again, how are you using that data in a, in a way to really advance something meaningful? Um, that's still something that some organizations are working with still struggle with. So being more data focused in mind, it, you know, coming from top down is something that the organizations that do have a greater level of maturity are, are embracing that and it flows down throughout the organization uh, in terms of how staff in general are kind of, again, using, uh, using data uh, for their you know, various uh, tasks or strategic initiatives. Yeah. And when you're setting these, having these strategic alignment where you're talking about goals and metrics and KPIs, one of my favorite sessions at a recent ASAE tech conference was uh, Juan Sanchez and Tim Hopkins were talking about OKRs, which are, you know, objectives, outcomes, and or key results. And instead of people worrying about outputs all the time, like I have lots of reports, so that means that I'm making progress. It's what's your outcome. <laughs> and one of the checks that I have on myself when I'm writing a goal or you know any kind of metric is, so what? So if, if I have it, is it really moving the ball? Is it helping the organization meet its goals? Yes or no? Because I think a lot of people get tied up in, this is the right thing to do. This is a good thing to do. This is a best practice. But a best practice for one organization may not work with another. So those are the, the two things that I think help me focus when I'm writing the goals. And then you just stop two or three, and that's plenty. Mm -hmm. Good, great advice. Any other highlights here, Dan? You know, I, I would say that the focus typically is on it's interesting. A lot of the focus tends to be on the like the technology and the infrastructure itself. But the reason we kind of broke this up in these four different areas is because they all are equally important. And again, not to hammer home again the culture piece, but it really is important. Um, you can put in great software, but if you don't have the right uh, process and culture to embrace it and use it, it's you're not going to really do much with it. And then of course data, which is where association analytics lives and breathes. But you know, where is your data? How are you collecting it? Are you taking good care of it? Are you using it effectively? You know, that's why we're here today. All right. Yeah, so I, one thing I would I would add quickly there, yeah. just to to 
hit on your point of, of so what, right? I mean, like, uh, and asking why are you doing things? I think collection is, uh, is a big one. So, you know, when, when we look at, at strategy, um, you know, I mean, it, some, of the, some of the things are obvious, like you should do an inventory of your systems and make sure they're doing what you want and all of that, you know, but right. with regard to your data collection, Mm-hmm. There's, there's a tendency to just want to accumulate, right? These massive amounts of data, which you do anyway. <laughs> right. But um, asking, you know, what is, uh, what's the purpose of each piece of, uh, each piece of data that's collected and you know, what kind of decisions can be made with it, made with it and all that is a really uh, useful thing because chances are, you know, although you have a lot of data, um, and you may not have exactly the right data to make the decisions uh, that you want to make. So when you go through a governance process and when you are implementing or preparing to implement an, an analytic solution, it's a really good time to kind of revisit all of those protocols and, and things around your data collection. Mm-hmm. So excellent segue okay. into governance. That's how you execute, right? So for ch- you know, you have to have a plan and then how are you going to execute your plan? And so that's um, really what we want to spend some time on in talking about just the how, how are you gonna do this? What are some techniques that you can use that aren't overwhelming? All right, so. All right, we got a, another pie chart. Okay, here we go. Oh, yeah, Bill was saying that analysts hate pie charts. Whoops. <laughs> so this is a more survey results from our last session, right, Bill? That's right. Um, yeah, so, uh, oh. go ahead, Dan. No, I'm sorry, go ahead. I, so I, I actually like this pie chart. You know, we're, that's what we were talking about, <laughs> that, uh, you know, data scientists and, um, and analysts are, are not as fond of them, but for this one, you know, the, just a couple of choices here. I think it makes it uh, makes it really clear where people stand with regard to, um, to to governance policies, right? I mean, there's there's a there's a few no's, and there's but but there's yes in progress and on our radar, right? So the most mm-hmm. you say the majority of the audience is going to be somewhere between like we're just getting started with that or mm-hmm. we're we're in the process. I don't think too many are like completely finished, right? Because it's never really finished. And, right. and not that many are just not thinking about it at all. So like you said at the beginning, it's now's the right time uh, to be uh, to be talking about this. And if you haven't started, you know, it's not too late. So that's what uh, Dan and I are big proponents of. Start somewhere and keep it simple and then revisit it. And at some point, find the, the right size, the right balance so that you don't go the other way of going from nothing to a very onerous data governance process that people avoid. And so you got to mm-hmm. kind of, be mindful of those checks and balances. But just to get started, you know, here's a, these are some of the components that we think are really imp- important um, to put your data together. So right. I think we, is there anything to highlight here, tenants. Dan? Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I was just gonna say, there's a number of tenants. I think the data governance gets so overwhelming for a lot of organization because there are so many different tenants of it. And so we try to break it down and we'll talk a little bit more about the components momentarily, but yeah. Um, these are some of the areas that we do like start with in terms of um, breaking down the discussion in a little more kind of palatable ways for, for the organization to start talking about data. Right. So even if you just do a tiny bit in each one of these areas, and we'll, we'll go there next. So here's, here's some of the foundational pieces. This is a big thing right now, confidentiality. It, it, you know, we've been talking about this for a long time, starting way back with can spam and then GDPR and now California and, you know, over 20 states are having some type of data privacy regulation. So it's not even a request, it's becoming regulatory. Um, and is it, do we trust the data? That's always been a big problem. And then can I get my hands on it? And so, you know, this is something that Dan really likes to emphasize. Again, if you had to pick three, what do you call it, Dan? The iron triangles, like here's, here's three favorites that we like. And for the clients that are doing it right, they, yes, they, they get all three of these. Because we, again, we're trying to distill a lot of this down into just again, layman's terms where staff can really um, understand these concepts. Again, because a lot of times we start talking about these things, it, it just gets nebulous and it gets a little frustrating in terms of, you know, what are we really doing with all this? So really these three tenants are kind of what we, we always like to uh, bring up at the beginning, beginning of an engagement and towards the end too, when we circle back. But I think that's a good point, Dan, that a lot of people who like governance or see the value in it get into geek speak and they forget who their audience is. So I think you also have to make sure you're writing when you're thinking about governance, there are maybe two audiences. One is, are the more technical people who are really gonna have to adhere to it and make it happen behind the scenes. And then there are um, other members of the association staff or some of your, even your members who just need to know that it's happening and have the kind of marketing mm-hmm. point of view so that they understand what's happening. 
Exactly. So there's a, we're gonna just kind of walk through, these are the, the, the six or seven things that um, we talked about before, which is the components. And so data management is something that can be very, very scary. You know, we have all of this data, how are we gonna break it down? And you need to start somewhere. And so frequently in associations, of course, it's your member and your customer and what information um, do you need to help them make good decisions about accessing your content? Mm -hmm. And depending on the size of the organization, um, not that there's always a one-to-one -one relationship, but typically the larger associations that we work with do have um, a wider breadth of you know, repositories of data. So this can, this can get a little more challenging, but I've worked, we've worked with smaller clients too that have data all over the place. And it really just, um, getting your hands around this. But again, same thing, it just starts somewhere. Don't be you know, too by it, but just start prioritizing those core data areas of what, you know, where do they reside, who's the data owner, and uh, just start getting your hands around that again. Just, it starts simple, some of the basic um, data tenants. Um, quick, quick, quick question okay. for you guys on that one. Is that, um, give us a sense for like how formal that has to be, right? When you say master data management, right? Um, does that have to be, a, a formal document, right? That's, uh, you know, or a formal set of procedures and guidelines or what's like, what's kind of the minimum, right? If, if we don't have that at all, you know, but we yeah, well, want We have to... an example in a minute. I think that all of these, you have to have at least a framework written down. And especially around data, because if you have data in different sources and they have different uses and people call them different things, if you don't at least start with what is a member, what is an, an attendee, and to define it and then say, where, do, where is the actual data that we trust the most? Because now with integration, data is moving all over the place. So if you have an integration where AMS data is going into a virtual event platform and the events team lives there, that's their member data that they're used to. But the membership team may be referring to the AMS. And so as that data is transformed, as members join and renew and, and do different activities, they're, they're um, the look of it could change. So I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. And compliance is one where, you know, again, you wanna manage risk. Everybody hates talking about it, it's annoying. But so if you don't have some way to, to make sure you're aware of compliance, you don't always, I think people get worried about putting too many rules in place. Sometimes compliance is simply, we know what the risk is and we're, we're, we can live with it, it's fine. I want a quick note on compliance, Joe. I would say that of these, it's interesting, the last two years, probably because of GDPR, really, mm -hmm. I, this is an area where I th there is a greater level of maturity that I've yeah. seen compliance. Mm -hmm. it, it, your hands, right? I mean, TCI, GDPR, so it's kind of forced, I think, it's associations to uh, acknowledge that. But I, of these, compliance does tend to be a little bit more mature uh, mm -hmm. when you're looking at these different areas. Yeah, and, and also just like with things like PCI, you may not need to get PCI certified, or but if you follow a lot of the best practices, it'll reduce a lot of the risk, mm -hmm. especially when it comes to data. All right, integration is another one, Dan, that I think has matured a lot, and it and during 2020, it really put that on hyperdrive. Where if these systems are not talking to each other, the user experience is so difficult. I think that's where I've seen a lot of people investing in this and mm -hmm. doing a much better job. Now writing it down so that you remember and it can add to it. People aren't doing such a great job, but I think really focusing on having systems talk to each other has been something I've seen a lot of movement in 2020. Right, I'd agree. All right. Data storage, this one I think is when you get into the more mature areas about if you're actually gonna move your data out of the core system and really think about a data storage solution. I think this is a more advanced and frequently with larger organizations. Uh, Dan or Bill, do you see anything different? No, no, I, th I think I agree with you. Would you mind if I actually made a quick point about integrations? I, I was nope, too, I was too slow no, just, to, <laughs> no, I was too slow ahead. jumping in there. <laughs> Please do. Um, there's four. Um, so, so we did a a, a webinar um, uh, last week, and uh, and Reggie Henry joined us on that, mm -hmm. and it was about uh, systems of action versus um, mm. you know, versus. Uh, uh, storage systems essentially and the, the key part of it was integrations right and we talked mm -hmm. about um, integration platforms and, and data hub type of technologies you know but right. the point Reggie made that I want to share is he said you know if 
if your systems are not talking to each other, then you really just have applications. Like we don't call them systems anymore. So if they're not integrated mm -hmm. and they're not sharing data okay. between, then they're not systems. And so anyway, that's, you know, whether you do it through a platform, an integration platform, a data hub, or you, mm -hmm. um, you have these point to point integrations with your AMS or you utilize, you know, something like uh, Acumen. Um, this one is, um, yeah, it's, it's really important, obviously, but it's not just like there's one the, the first time. It's, it's something that you really need to pay attention to ongoing and, and keep uh, maintaining. Yeah. Excellent point. Yeah, I would completely agree. Okay. So where are we? Okay. Data oh, security. My circle's moving around now. Here we go. Sorry. <laughs> fancy. Too, yeah, the graphics are too clever for us. Uh, oh, data, yeah. data security. Yeah, and this is another one where as more and more platforms or new platform as a service and those platforms are getting uh, more secure, I think the associations just benefit because this is a nightmare if you're trying to do it on your own. You really need to be making sure that the, the platform level um, is taking care of that. Yeah, quick comment on that. I, I would agree. I think this is this has evolved over the last 10 plus years too in terms mm -hmm. of um, less homegrown databases, therefore less you know premise-based Data, like sensitive data being, you know, residing in servers or databases that are kind of within your um, jurisdiction, for lack of a better term. But as more more associations have moved to, you know, more cloud-based or SaaS-based uh, association management systems and other just SaaS-based products, um, I would still say though, you make sure that you focus on this. In terms, I think there, I, I still sometimes see though, there's this. Well, it's not our problem anymore. You know, we're using you know XYZ vendor to house our data. Um, I still think, though, you still need to understand, though, if there is any kind of breach or anything of that nature, you still need to pay attention to this area, though. So just be mindful of that. Just think just because you're using a vendor to, you know, an AMS vendor to, that houses your, your data, you, you still are, you still need to be mindful of this and pay attention to the, the, the ramifications of the security. Right. And the biggest security risk is people. So the systems are pretty secure, but it's when people take it out and put it in a spreadsheet and email it to somebody then you broke all those protocols. So you have all this really good secure data, your vendors are doing all this great work with security, and then I pull it out and, and send it to somebody I'm not supposed to, you just blew all that up. Mm -hmm. So I think how users think about security is where you should focus, is you can't share this, you know, if you have an exhibitor list and you wanna share it with somebody, you also have to follow um, some protocols about how they can use it, when they can use it, how you're gonna get it back. So I think that's where it all breaks is when human beings you know, cheat or take shortcuts or do, they're just not aware. They don't even think about how that is introduces a risk that you've been trying to mitigate this whole time. Absolutely. And it's tied to the integrations too, right? I mean, the mm -hmm. sensitive data yeah. that's getting passed along that needs to be coordinated between the vendors. And, and that's a balance, right? Some people are like, but I don't have any other choice. Like I don't have an integration. I have to import and export data and move it myself. I mean, that's something that smaller organizations struggle with are people who don't have, you know, to IT people to help them. So again, it's just awareness of what is the risk? Is it really a risk? Is it one you can live with? It's not that big of a deal because there's nothing sensitive. So that mm -hmm. doesn't mean just stop and do nothing. It's just say, what, what's our policy here at our association? What is our tolerance for this? How much time are we wasting or saving? And does this really help us? You know, if we need to spend time on this. So some people just stop immediately and say, oh my gosh, we have to do all this work. Maybe not, maybe we just need to be aware of it. Right, no. Yeah. And, and data quality is another one of those. Like the quality is something that will hang people up and it will put the brakes on a project. And I've seen this over and over and over when people work with an analytics platform and they start seeing their data, all of the errors come out. <laughs> and people have a hard time pushing through that and saying, is it good enough to make the decision? So back to your goal, that's why you have a strategy. Like this is why we're using this data to solve this problem. Is this quality a blocker or is it a distraction? And I think that's something that you, it, it's good to get some advice, especially, you know, I know Bill, your team will say that. You'll say, this data set is good enough or this data set is trash and you can't rely on it at all. Yeah, defining uh, thresholds is important. <laughs> what, what's good enough? I mean, because again, you're never going to get 100% perfection. That's just not the unicorn. You're not, you're not going to get it. So, but I, yeah, I, I'm sure, you know, Bill's team stresses this all the time. And I think that's something too to be mindful for really getting the mindset of what is good enough for your data quality. And certain, it also depends on the area. I mean, there's certain areas that require more stringent data quality than others. But again, just making sure that you're 
aware of that uh, in terms of defining realistic, you know, threshold. So do you have any like, you know, just general rules of thumb for that bill when people start to get really worried about quality? Yes. Uh, okay. So our um, got a couple. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there, there's the, there can be some exceptions to this, but um, in almost every case, um, our general rule is get started with what you have. Mm -hmm. And keep in mind that data quality improvement is a continuous improvement process, right? So um, making the decision with uh, whatever data you have in almost every case is better than not doing it at all. Mm -hmm. And so the cost of, of delaying that, you know, because of poor data quality, it's just not really worth it. You should get you're started. Saying you just say keep going no matter what. Almost. I mean, right, oh. like I said, you know, there could be there could be exceptions to that. But right. um, in most cases, you can get started with the data in its current um, shape. And, and like you said, once you get those things visualized, all of your problems, all the areas, all the source systems that you need to go back mm -hmm. and, um, and, and do corrections, all that stuff comes to light. And it's, it's a lot more likely to get done you know, when it's there in charts that people are looking at and preventing people from working effectively in some cases. So yeah, it's, I mean, uh, my, my advice is to, um, to get started and correct it little by little as you go along. Okay, all right, so how do you get started? Um, we always like to say, what are the business questions you're trying to answer? And so it's good to have a target. Um, and, I, and I think this is good advice that most analysts want to know, like, what, what are you solving for here? And, and I think the more practical you can make it, the better. Instead of, you know, trying to be really fancy, it's like, you're, you're trying to, your organization is in business to do certain things. What are those things? And how are you measuring them in a, in a real way? Um, and I think you need to really be thoughtful about this. It's, is, is retention the most important thing you could be measuring, you know, whether members renew or not, or if your retention is pretty stable, is that something that you can just monitor, but really then spend time focusing on measuring if people are actually using the services that you have. So I don't, Bill, are there, there are there, business questions that people ask that you say, those are just pretty common, but you should really think deep, more deeply about it or, or think of a different angle. These are a couple that Dan and I were kicking around. Yeah, I mean, I think you're, I think you're on the right track there, which yeah. is basically, um, you know, every, every association tends to think of, you know, the, the high level aggregate mm -hmm. numbers, like, you know, right. total member count and um, total, you know, aggregate retention rates and things like that. So mm -hmm. the, the, the some of the, the first level of, of real decision making that you can start to get to when you when you do some of these things is is look at those same kinds of things but within certain segments, right? So if your mm -hmm. if your retention is dropping a little bit, you know that um, it's most likely because you know you're struggling in one particular segment, and right. if you can quickly identify that and yeah. and think about what actions to take to to remedy it, it's it's much better than just knowing the high level numbers. Okay. I like what Gretchen said too. I think if your retention rate or <clears throat> some of these numbers are fairly consistent, like there's no need to spend a lot of time on it, but yet I still feel like a lot of associations do. I'm not saying not saying they're not important. It's just that, yeah, can you allocate your time and resources elsewhere uh, and dig into some of these more um, specific areas? Okay. And then now we, you asked earlier, Bill, about a data glossary and how exact it has to be. We, we like to use things that are simple like a spreadsheet. You know, what, what is the, where is the data living right now? What's the name of the field? How is it used? And what's its definition? And some of these things that you assume everyone knows what a lapsed member is, it's who you ask. So membership might say, finance might say you're lapsed the day you, of your expiration date. The day, you know, December 31st, you are lapsed because you have used up your money. Membership might say, well, we give people like 30 extra days to pay. So they're still pretty much members. And marketing might say, if, you know what, if they've been a member within the last six months, close enough, we're going to use them. And so defining these things is really important because I think one of the biggest ways to erode trust in data is when different departments report different numbers from the same place. And people are like, I don't know what I trust. And a lot of it comes back to the data set you pulled or the question you asked was different. That last, the last member uh, example you just had, Gretchen, I, mm -hmm. I this week, there, yeah, there, the, the different areas weren't kind of agreeing on it. So again, it seems really rudimentary, right. but 
it's really important. You know, another way the angle of approaching this is maybe not so much even focusing on the areas that you do agree on, but maybe put out there, what are the areas mm -hmm. you agree on and start there and work backwards mm -hmm. uh, and, and see what are the terms that uh, the different departments don't maybe see eye to eye on and addressing those first. Mm -hmm. So again, keep it simple, start with the spreadsheet. And if you do some of this pre-work as your core team at your association really wrestle with this a little bit, and then you go work with an analytics expert, you will move so much faster because you've already started to get yourself in the right mindset of being a little bit more flexible, making sure you're defining what you, you assume everybody knows to a stranger. So if you've already done some of this work and you've said, what are these definitions? What is our primary address? Do we care that half of our members don't have an address? We just have an email and a phone number. Is that good enough? If you've already started answering some of these questions, then when you meet with someone like Association Analytics or a data scientist, then you can really start getting into the work of, of looking at it and you can kind of move a little bit quicker during this phase. And Are there any other homework assignments you would like to people to do when they're defining their data bill? No, I don't think so. I think you, I think you hit all the right points. I mean, come up with a, a framework, you know, mm -hmm. some kind of basically a spreadsheet, um, yeah. you know, make uh, a few entries into that spreadsheet and then encourage, um, you know, your other, you know, key stakeholders to uh, participate in that. And you know, even without, even without it being much more formal than that, you're already well on your way to, to having some of the foundations here. And I think, you know, if you get a little bit more sophisticated, the next column I would add is, does this data touch anything else? So does it integrate with an event registration system, learning management system? And if it does, is it one way or two way? So I think that's the other place where data can get transformed and people forget about it. So if this data leaves and goes to a event registration or learning management system and more information is added, then I think it's just really important to know that it's gonna transition and there may be more that you need to, to learn. Mm -hmm. okay. All right. So after you start figuring out your data, during that data glossary time, you are starting to look at where does all this data live? And it's not just your systems. People keep things still in spreadsheets. They keep them in Google Drives, OneDrive, name a storage system, Box, uh, Dropbox. It's all over the place. And I think it's really important to, this is not a shaming exercise. This is just, where does it live? Mm -hmm. You know, we just right, need to go right. find it. And so I think people worry about getting caught by um, hiding data in different places. One of the things we do, and it, tie, it does tell a little bit into our, even our technology maturity assessment is, yeah, when we do that kind of inventory of all applications and data mm -hmm. applications that even are some of the clients that think they have a pretty good handle on this, there's always right. do that still that kind of bubble up and they're like, really, we got data there? So it's, it's a good exercise. And again, yeah, like you said, it's not shaming anyone. It's just really making sure you get your hands around it. Mm -hmm. And again, that may identify why some of your numbers are off. It's because somebody is layering in a little bit of extra data that they've gathered in a, in a non-traditional way. So then once you know where it is, you have to be able to get to it. And so, so again, some people, data is locked up where marketing has it in their marketing automation tool, but it's not integrated fully with the AMS or it's a mystery and people know about it. They know about what's happening behind the scenes, but they don't really understand it. So this is another good time to educate people and up their game a little bit about, you need to understand how these systems work together. You don't need to know the code, but you do need to understand how data travels around your organization and what happens to it when it moves. The other component to this we sometimes see is that one department may start collecting data even in their AMS that another department is not even aware of, right? So maybe marketing starts collecting all this demographic data that the events team has no idea that they're doing. Uh, and so just getting those areas to talk sometimes, again, making sure that, because they might be needing to leverage that data too. So they may not A, know that it's even getting collected and B, that they might even have access to it, so. Or the reverse, you're collecting it in a learning management system and it can just stay there. It doesn't need to move because it's, it's used for one purpose. You know, are you going through the learning pathway? Yes or no? And people are tempted to say, oh yeah, I need that data. Why? And I think that's when you need to go back to the so what. So when you start going on these discovery meetings, some people are like, ooh, this is fabulous. I need to have it. And, and you need to 
that's where, again, this strategy and governance comes into play of, do you really need it? Or it's missing. Do we need to stop and go get it? Or can we keep going to your point, Bill, just keep plowing on? Um, and then the last step is accuracy. And this is where, you know, I mentioned earlier, I, I think people can really get hung up here. And so this is where you have to define what does accuracy mean? And in, in today's age, what fields did you use to collect that are just had to be perfect? And now, you know, they're secondary. This area too, I prioritize what, what data sets do you want to prioritize to discuss? Because I think this is another area that really mm -hmm. companies down because the thought of getting in a meeting your colleagues to debate for two hours what's good enough for your data can it seems really tedious and painful so uh, I would say you know make sure that what are the areas that, that are the most important and prioritize those um, start with those discussions because again I think when you get in data cleansing it cleanliness uh, that's where I think some of these uh, data governance initiatives can really get bogged down yeah uh, and then, oh, I got some thought it, it'll come back to me <laughs> and then the last is, you know, we were just talking about this, transforming it to making sure it gets into the correct format. Oh, I know what I was going to say. This is where automation really has come a long way. And so there are so many services out there that can help you if you can define the rule, clean up your data and get it into a better state. And this is another area of control of you have to trust these services to do it. It might be 80% accurate, but that's way better than having you do check these records one at a time. So... Yeah. This is another, you know, outsource this <laughs> as much There's, as you can. I completely agree, Gretchen. There's some new services that are subscription-based that are based based on like machine learning that you can kind of train these uh, scripts that more or less will help clean your data. And it's a subscription-type mm -hmm. model, which it's pretty cool. But it's something else, too, that, again, get out of the habit of having to try to do these uh, manually or else, you know, twice every uh, few years, but really trying to do this on a regular basis. So mm -hmm. there, here's where we've seen some maturity and a more affordable cost too. Some, so there are tools out there for this. Right. And then the last step is, of course, sharing it, making sure people have access to it, permissions. Um, so that's just some fundamental good habits. All right. So once you've started to do this, so, you know, how do you do, how do you put these habits to use? We like to say that this, this is a group effort. Like Dan's mentioned several times, talk to your colleagues. So not, no one person generally knows the answer. And even if you're a small staff organization, then there's five people, then all five of you get together and talk about it because every role will have a different point of view. And so we really advocate for a, a steering committee who is empowered to make these decisions and really have some of those deep discussions so that they understand how their colleagues are using data and are educating each other, but with the goal of advancing the business. Mm -hmm. And I think having a data steering team also helps you check each other. So I have a hobby horse that I get very passionate about. I think it's very helpful sometimes when Dan says to me, but it really doesn't help us get to this goal. So that one we might need to park and deal with it later. And I think that's the other benefit of the steering committee. Mm -hmm. And then just what are the steps for your organization? So again, different organizations may have different gates that information has to go through. You know, sometimes you need to have finance involved in almost every step if it's talking about finance data or we've talked about marketing. It's different for every group, but just create a simple guide of where, who needs to know what and when. And I think we've talked about goals quite a bit, but yes, that yeah, can't stress it enough. <laughs> yes, exactly. Focus on that. Yeah, that that will help. It'll help greatly when you're in those meetings and you're trying to uh, sift through a lot of this. I mean, you got to stay focused on uh, again those goals and outcomes. Just what you said, Gretchen. I mean, you know, is this going to advance one of these strategic initiatives? Yes or no. So those are, that's, those are the things you start with. And then find time to adjust. So this isn't every day, this is not once a week. I, you know, in yearly, maybe a good time once you get started or when you're about to hit a big milestone, if you're about to go into another big project, it may be helpful to say, 
you know, let's just check some alignment here because we've, we've done some different things in the organization or it's been a while or we've added a new system. And so these are things that we like to see if you've started in the basic level, these are some things that Dan and I put together mm -hmm. about, okay, how do you extend your governance a little bit or how do you expand your strategy a little bit more? Exactly. These are just nice check-ins periodically to check you know, or changing data sources. You know, to Bill's point, I know there's always this idea of wanting to collect more, but you know, there's, I work with some clients that have actually simplified some of their uh, application process and therefore they've eliminated some of the, the sets of data they had been collecting. So you know, are you moving away from some of that? So just making sure that uh, you're staying on top of the, this and even to your point, Gretchen, I, I Quarterly, twice a year, just doing these check-ins, I think, are, are, are helpful once you get it up and running. Okay. Bill, what do you see people adding that you find really useful that when you tell people, okay, now that you've, you've really done a good job with this first layer, what are some other things that you see people adding or taking out of their strategy or their governance? Uh, um, yeah, so it's really useful to, to look at it almost in terms of engagement right and mm. so this is not an engagement webinar but mm. um typically like you, you know the closest things that you look at you know for your engagement of your mm -hmm. uh, members and customers are in your ams their transactions you know event mm. attendance purchases membership transactions things like that and okay. so you definitely want to start there you know when it comes to governance but um but then there's a lot of things that are in that next layer out right like lms learning is really important for many associations there uh, their community, and then maybe um, uh, maybe finance would be next. So I mean, those those are like the uh, those are the next things, and then yeah. um, and then maybe even one layer out from that is is your web, you know, website visits, your traffic, um, your social media data, things like that. So it's kind of like you know starting with the uh, the core transactions, you know, then um, you know then moving out from there to things that are. Um, that are you know more contextual, right? And they're giving you more, um, you know, more information about your your members and customers, but are not necessarily those you know those core facts, those, those core routine things that you're dealing with every day. What's your opinion though on now that there is so much um, data being exchanged in chat in these virtual settings, and uh, about adding some of that unstructured data earlier in the process, or do you still feel like you got to get the fundamental transactions down and then start layering that more? Um, uh well, the, I mean, the, yeah, I mean, the, well, the good news with that is, you know, that it's, it's unstructured and, and so just sort of inherently, it, it's not as, it doesn't really have to go through as much, you know, in, in regards to your governance process mm -hmm. and, and your data quality processes, it's really yeah. just finding a good way to extract some insight uh, mm -hmm. from that. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think it can be done in parallel, right? And okay. if you have, uh, and if you have the the appetite for it, and if you have the aptitude to to collect that uh, that unstructured data, there's some very good, um, you know, there's some very, even if you don't buy a product like Document, there's some good services that you can, you know, that you can um, extract, you know, uh, keywords and themes and things but, like yeah, that. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you because, huh. like Dan said, there's a bunch of services now that can automate data cleanup, but I've seen more and more services popping up, or as part of virtual event platforms, I've seen that as a service where they'll take all of the chat and, and mix it up with what the speaker was saying and give people a summary of that. Is that something that's portable that if I receive that from my virtual event platform that um, I could put into a tool like Acumen and, and, and add that as a source? It is, I mean, most often you'd actually just put in the raw data and Acumen would oh, do it, okay. right? And so you so, don't want it cleaned up, you want the raw data. <laughs> raw Make data. It, yeah, I mean, usually the raw yeah. data is gonna be okay. better because then it uh -huh. can be more easily combined with other things that you already have in low levels of granularity as well. All right, I was just curious because I'm seeing that come up more and more and, and I think that's something people may want to ask for, you know, as you're talking to your virtual event vendors, like how do I get some of that information out so I can do, so, you know, look at it. Yeah, and if you, if you don't have it, um, if they don't offer that service, but they mm -hmm. can give you the raw data, like your chat sessions from your Zoom meetings and things, mm -hmm. um, you can, uh, you know, Microsoft Azure has a service that does that. Oh, um, okay. Amazon, AWS, Amazon Web Services also has that. Mm -hmm. And I would encourage people to experiment with that. And ultimately, mm -hmm. you'll probably want to combine it with other engagement points, you know, mm -hmm. in a platform like Acumen, but you definitely can get started with those. All right, cool. 
Oh, thanks. I was wondering about that. Okay, so um, we're this is our last uh, formal slide, um, but Delcor does um, provide data governance assessments and and help our clients plan for things. And so this is just a wrap up of kind of everything we talked about. Data governance is something that you know it's very common in the industry. This is just how we package it to help our clients walk through it so that it's not so daunting and, and help get started. All right, so. Great. Questions. Are there any questions? That's awesome. Uh, I saw a good minutes. resource. Somebody popped in a, um, a book to read, I think I saw in there. Let's see, somebody mentioned. And yeah, I think I saw a question too about other tools. Uh, resource list for some of the tools we referenced, which Gretchen and I can collect those and coordinate with Bill and maybe get those out too. Yeah. So I have, I have a question while we're waiting for, uh, for things to, to maybe come in through the chat. Mm -hmm. So chat or Q&A. Um, we have a bunch of people on here, so I'm sure there's some questions, so don't be shy. Uh, but, but my question is, um, for a typical engagement, right, and I know that they can vary, they can be large, you know, medium, small, or whatever, but uh, you know, for the people on the call here, if they sign up for a data governance engagement with um, with Delcor, what are some of the the deliverables, right? What do I uh, what do I end up with? Well, there's a formal assessment deliver like a report that we'll go out and we kind of outline all the recommendations and we'll help yeah. prioritize those for you, um, both in various levels of effort, short-term, medium, you know, long-term, and um, helping break that down, I think providing the clarity of the issues that the organization is going through is kind of the main feedback, we like the benefit of, of that deliverable, because I think what happens when we work with a lot of these clients is that they know it in the back of the head, they sense a lot of these things, mm -hmm. and so I think having it articulated uh, in terms of the requirements, or sorry, the recommendations that is, and then prioritized and helping them form an action plan is, is kind of the primary takeaway that they have something. Okay, now I got some kind of roadmap here that I can move forward on. Whereas you kind of felt in this kind of nebulous state space before, you know, you have all these issues, but uh, you just don't know the, you know, the scope or the breadth of them. And then we just get you started. Like we just said, here's some questions you should put in your strategy. Now you build it out. So we like to do a lot of here. Why don't you get started? Mm -hmm. And we also, um, work really closely if they're gonna work with an analytics vendor to say, what does your data glossary look like? Let's work on that together. And so we try to do some coaching and, and sometimes we're the facilitator to help people kind of tease out those issues. If people just sit in a room and say, yep, everything's fine. I was like, really? All right. But earlier when we were talking to you, this is a data constraint you were talking about. Well, now we're actually mapping out your data, but it's all fine. And so we try to help people get people started and just again keep them focused so there's three or four different pieces that we help people come up with a data glossary the integration plan um, some of their goals so that they can either do their own analysis or work with a vendor but at least it gets them started right okay and bill what are what are your favorite um when clients come to you and say okay we're ready for a project what are some things that really slow down a project and what things help speed them up? Uh, well, I mean, in terms of slowing things down, it's, uh, you already brought this up earlier, which it's a little bit of fear, I guess, mm -hmm. in a sense, right? Which yeah. is, um, we're not ready for this because our data is not in, in good shape. And mm -hmm. as I said, you know, our recommendation there is typically to, um, to get started yeah. and, um, and then look at data quality and, and, you know, completeness and, and all of those things as, you know, things that you can um, add later, right? I mean, mm -hmm. there, there may be, um, you know, very often we'll, we'll show some, um, some visualizations, some different types of breakdowns. I'm like, wow, that looks awesome. But, you know, we don't have any of that data, right? <laughs> um, but the truth is, I mean, they, they do have, it's all interchangeable. It's all configurable. So they do have data that they can be using. Um, they can make decisions. They can um, they can calculate and score engagement, even if it's in a rudimentary way, and they can build on that, uh, build on that over time. So I think more and more we're, we're able to, to demonstrate that, um, that the, 
the cost of, of not getting started are going to outweigh any sort of risks that you have with, you know, getting started imperfectly in, in some ways. Okay. Sure. And I, I would say what's, what's the downside of just shining a big bright light? <laughs> it is right. It means like, you know, it's out there. It's like the sphere yeah. of the unknown, but at, at least it's in front of you and it might even be worse than you think it is, but at least you get in front of you and then you can actually have a game plan to, to right. tap it. That's true. But I also think people, uh, worry about uh, blame. I really, I really think that that's an impediment yeah. to people. Of like, you know, I've been in membership for years, and so now they're going to go look at the membership data. And what if it's not what it should have been? Or because I always, you know, I always wanted to do fix it, and I just never had time. I think people get really nervous about what what's exposed because <laughs> people are it's personal, you know. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm sure no one on this call has that problem. <laughs> <laughs> the other person. <laughs> That's right. Okay. Right. Well, here's our last right. couple. Here, here's how to contact us. There's a hundred different ways, right? And um, Delcor and Association of Analytics both love the color green, and so uh, here's here's our contact information. And then, Bill, do you want to talk about the next event? A little yeah. Bit? Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. Uh, Thank you everyone for, for joining and for your, for your comments and, and questions today. Uh, I wanna invite everybody to join us for our next webinar. As I mentioned earlier, it's, uh, you know, we meet bi-weekly on Thursday. So the next one is February 11th at 3 p.m. We're gonna be talking about, um, uh, about virtual events, but kind of specifically about how to plan your events you know, with virtual first in mind, which is you know, something we Never thought we'd be doing, but pretty mm -hmm. much every association <laughs> is uh, is doing now. So yeah. uh, we're going to be joined by our, our good friends at uh, Open Water, who have a, uh, a really, uh, really good platform and a lot of uh, interesting ideas to share in that area. Um, so hope everyone uh, can join us. But uh, uh, for today, I want to thank Dan and Gretchen for uh, for joining us. It was it was fun, and I hope everyone uh, learned a lot. And we hope to see you again soon. Great. Well, thanks for inviting. Thanks, us. Bill. Yeah, All appreciate right. it. All right. See thanks, you everybody. Oh, what, oh, question flashing. Oh, no. Oh, it says thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Ed. <laughs> oh, thank you. Good to see you.